Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us again as we continue on the platform uh, that we've created within BITA. Um, I am delighted to say that I'm in better health now um, and we are joined again today by Martin Mokler uh, to continue um, the information that we've been giving you um, via the BITNU uh, portal, as we've said. So um, over to you, Martin, and give us the latest update in terms of the financials um, of uh, this uh, COVID-19. So I suppose, as we've said during the last two sessions, it really is so dynamic. There, there is so much happening, both on the ground in terms of people's businesses and the sort of commercial reality and the commercial impact, and then through government announcements on a regular basis, uh, emanating uh, from the Treasury in through the Chancellor, who um, makes some very large and very impressive announcements. Uh, and then, the, you know, following that, we have to sort of tease out the detail and, uh, and figure out, along with the likes of HMRC and the local authorities, figure out what these announcements mean and, and how they will work. A classic example is the jobs retention scheme, where the word furlough wasn't used in the English language until the, the 20th of March and uh, is, is now commonplace and HMRC are busily writing code at the moment to try and have a, a website and a portal operational by the end of this month. So, you know, it, there, there is, I, I've said, this, I've used the phrase before, but there is no rule book um, at present. It, it is, you know, both government and businesses are, are you know, the phrase making it up as they go along is not, is not fair, um, but they are really, it is, it is announcements on the hoof. And for example, uh, an, another example of, of one of the, the, you know, the, the big measures announced early on was the Sybil scheme, the coronavirus business interruption loan scheme, which has had a lot of negative um, media in um, both print and, uh, and, and TV. And, and the banks really didn't know how to deal with it. And, and the, uh, the initial guidelines from government were, were contradictory and, um, and, and that confused the banks. And, uh, and, and there's an announcement either this evening or more likely tomorrow now from the Chancellor going to amplify uh, the rules of engagement and the, the sort of terms and conditions of that. So, um, you know, I'm happy to take questions on those two topics or, or any others that, um, that uh, are fielded and um, we can uh, walk through the, uh, the answers as, as, they, as they arise. Well, as we go here, there are some questions being fielded. And the first question is, can you explain how the business grants from local authorities will work? I, I will do my best. Um, that is a source of funding that again is, is very novel. So the government have announced that they are going to um, send money to the local authorities and that will be used to provide grants to small businesses. And um, so on um, the 27th, so last Friday, they made a, a sort of an early installment payment of 3.4 billion to all the local authorities in the UK. And they follow that up now uh, with the remainder of the funds. So the local authorities are, are in funds in principle, what we know so far is that there is no need to reach out to your local authority. If you are a, a rate payer and you avail of the small business relief on your, on your business rates, then you will be contacted by the local authority. And the, uh, the announcement is, is pretty clear. You should get a grant of up to £10,000. Uh, your business should get a grant of up to £10,000. Now, if you are in the retail, leisure or hospitality sector, then, and if your rateable value is in excess of 15,000 pounds, then your grant will be as high as 25,000 pounds. So these are fairly substantial numbers considering the number of businesses that are operational throughout the UK and the various local authorities. So there's, there's a huge amount of administration required at the back of this to try and process these, uh, these payments. The only um, sort of guidance beyond that is that if you're concerned that you won't get the money, then contact the local authority. Now that's, you know, a, a little bit, the first message is don't call us, we'll call you. Um, and, but then they have said if you're concerned. I don't know what that means. 
It means if you have recently become a rate payer and you, you didn't pay full rates for 1920, for example, we, we don't yet know. But certainly, the message is clear. The money has gone from government to the local authorities. They have the cash and it's now up to them to get it into the system. And the only other thing that's relevant there, um, and again, it only applies to businesses that are in the, the hospitality and, and leisure and retail sector, is that for those particular businesses, they won't pay business rates for 2021. So as of yesterday, 1st of April, they're exempt from rates until 31 March 2021. Okay, and the next question is to do with access. And it's, uh, do I have to contact the British um, Business Bank to access uh, CBILS loan? Okay, so um, I referred to it earlier on the Sybil's loan, the Coronavirus Business Interruption Loan Scheme. So the short answer to the question is no, you don't. The British Business Bank is a state-owned and state-run bank which historically has processed the enterprise finance guarantee schemes. So that source of funding, as I mentioned before, has been set aside and they're now focused on administering the civil loans. So that system is, is um, it's pretty clear what happens. There are 40 accredited lenders, although I believe that a few lenders have dropped off that list and a few more have applied to join. But there, there are a bunch of lenders and if you are a business and you need to make an application under the civil loan, you contact your bank directly. They will assess the, the merits of the business case of the loan. They will underwrite the loan. They'll approach their internal credit committees. And then if they approve that loan, it would then go to the British Business Bank. So the, the banks are the conduit. And in that front, do I have to provide a personal guarantee if I'm to apply, uh, apply for this loan? That poll is the $64,000 question. So the, again, I touched on it earlier, there was some ambiguity in the, in the headline announcements. So for example, it said that borrowings under 250,000 didn't require a personal guarantee. The problem is that the initial, um, the initial documentation that went on the website of the British Business Bank stated that the banks initially had to address these applications under normal banking criteria. So, yeah, so th th they were instructed to consider these as normal loans. And the problem there is these are not normal loans. So, so any applications that come into the banks, they felt that they were mandated to ignore the Sybil's facility first and see if the normal criteria applied. And the problem there is that the banks were badly burned under the old scheme, the EFG scheme, because under that facility, there were lots of examples of banks who had advanced money under EFG and then asked the British Business Bank to make good the state guarantee and, and that money wasn't forthcoming. The, the, state, the state said, well, you didn't do your underwriting properly in the first place, so we're not paying you out. So the banks have some uh, trauma in this area. Uh, and so they're very slow to expose themselves to the, uh, the potential risk. Now, the, the, the core principle of the scheme is that the, the state will stand behind 80% of the loan. So the banks, in any event, will always be on the hook for 20%. The banks were trying to make sure that they weren't on the hook for 100%. So to go back to the, to the, the question about the personal guarantee, so the banks then decided, well, okay, we'll try and cover all bases by taking personal guarantees. The only guidance they had there from government was that they couldn't take a charge on the main residence of the directors of the companies. But really, a personal guarantee is a backdoor to that main residence. Because if you sign a personal guarantee as an individual and the bank call in that guarantee, the first thing they look for is, is your main asset, which is your main residence. So again, that, that, that meant that this, the system was failing because individuals said, well, hang on now, we're told the state are going to stand behind us. We're told we don't have to put up our house and yet you're insisting on a 100% person guarantee. So this is, uh, this literally changes every day. And the latest is that ch the Chancellor is going to make an announcement probably tomorrow evening to say that person guarantees are, are, are no longer required. Now, sorry, correction. He's going to say that, and this is, sorry, this is rumor, but it, 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 rumors today have, have been borne out um, to, to, to translate into fact. 
the Chancellor is probably going to say that the individuals will have to give a personal guarantee for only 20% of the debt, not 100% of the debt. Now Lloyds Bank have gone one step further actually, and they have said they won't take any personal guarantees under any circumstances. What they will look for is any related assets that they have previously lent money on. So for example, we have a client and they have a successful um, contracting business. We set up a company a number of years ago and they bought an office block and they're lending, Lloyds are lending to both the trading company and the, uh, the investment company, if you like, that owns the office. Lloyds have said, we want a cross company guarantee between those companies because we're lending on both. And that's a limited set of circumstances, but they're the only circumstance under Lloyds will look for any form of security outside of the core trading business. Okay, and what about the ease of access to these business grants? And are there any reports of SMEs that have um, gotten these grants already? Well, there's the, 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 the certainly no business grants, just going back to the local authority grants. The business grants, none of them have come out yet because that money literally arrived with the local authorities on Friday and, 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 and yesterday. In relation to the civil zones, the short answer is, is no, very, very few. I was speaking to a senior member of the, uh, one of the underwriting teams in one of the, the large high street banks today. He said he has 40 applications on his desk. He can't prove any of them. He said the quality of the information is, is poor. The business case is poor. He said that the, the, the issue is that people are, are, are just, um, they them, the, the business owners themselves are traumatized. They're, they have, they see this as a, as a life raft. They're putting in applications that don't really, they're not really structured properly. The bank, the bank now, or as of hopefully tomorrow night, will be mandated by the chancellor to make sure these, this money starts flowing, that, that, that money's coming down this pipe. The reality is at the moment, it hasn't been. The banks, as I've explained, have been hesitant to push forward with the scheme. But if the Chancellor makes his announcement tomorrow night and he limits the person guarantees and the banks can assist their customers and give them guidance as to what criteria is required, then hopefully then, you know, there will be some cash flowing. But at present, you can count on one hand the number of approved cases. That's interesting. So how does uh, the SEISS work and, and will it apply to say, for instance, a QS one man band limited company? Okay, so to, to, to answer the second part of the question first, um, the, the likes of the, the, uh, the QS or the project manager or the contracts manager who has his own limited company, um, they're unfortunately the squeezed middle. They, they, they haven't been provided for in any of the measures that have been announced so far. The typical structure of those companies are that you've got a director who owns the shares, so he takes a small salary and a large dividend. So yes, he can technically furlough himself and get 80% of his salary paid by the government. That's generally up to 12 grand a year to cover his personal allowances, so he get 80% of 12 grand. There's no measure that is going to compensate him for his loss of dividends. And, and that's a problem. The government have said that they, the directors and shareholders can rely on universal credit, which, you know, it's, it's a safety net, but it's, it's really a, a measure of last resort. So, so the, the second part of the question is no. The, any, anybody who operates their own limited company with a small salary is probably going to face some difficulty. So part A, is the SEISS scheme. So that was announced last Friday night, which is only three working days ago, uh, four including today. Um, it is uh, such a novel scheme. Um, so basically, the HMRC are going to compensate self-employed workers for loss of income from for this period up until the end of June. Now, because seven point income varies considerably, then the approach they're taking is they're going to look at the last three self-assessment tax returns, average out that income, and assuming that the income is less than 50,000 pounds a year, they make a payment of up to 80% of that income. Now, the 50,000 pounds is an important figure because that's a cliff edge. If you happen to have an average of 51,000 over the last three years, you won't get anything, which is 
Again, quite harsh, but that's the way the system is, is structured. The other bit of bad news for anybody who will be relying on this scheme is that in any event, no payments will be released until the end of June. So these people have to survive. So you take a guy on the tools who's uh, whatever, bricklayer, chippy, whatever it might be, on a construction site that's closed down, he will have no income from the state apart from universal credit between now and the end of June. The only other thing to be mindful of of, of this scheme is um, it's like it's, it's going very hard to administer. So the, the revenue have said, a bit like the local authorities, don't call us, we call you. They're going to re review their systems, they're going to see if the individuals qualify, they then reach out to them and then they'll ask them to make an application. That's going to take some time, hence the, the, the lead time that they've indicated between now and June, that's three months away. So that's a long time for someone who maybe is living paycheck to paycheck and has mouths to feed. Um, so yeah, it's uh, such a novel scheme, a lot of administration required at the back end by HMRC and uh, time will tell how, how it plays out. The other thing they have said is that anybody who failed to get the 2019 self-assessment tax return in has until later this month to file that return and qualify for the scheme. So they've thrown a, a, life, uh, a life raft or a life belt to people who might be in arrears with the tax returns as well. So again, we don't have any detailed technical guidance. We have the announcement. The announcement made on, on Friday night, the 27th by the Chancellor provided more detail than previous announcements. So we do have a little bit more of a window into how it works, but, um, but not, not fine detail as of yet. Okay. Um, in terms of um, furlough, we mentioned earlier, um, how do I furlough my employees? And can I ask someone to work while they are furloughed? Okay, so again, I'll answer the second part of that question first. The, the, the clear answer from, from HMRC is no. If somebody's furloughed, they are set aside, they're, they remain on your payroll, but they're, they're not to be working. Um, HMRC have said in, in follow-up press releases that they will pursue companies if they're aware that, that the employees were furloughed uh, and were working. So tricky to see how they would um, be able to uh, pursue that um, other than being told by um, a third party that this, that this happened. But nonetheless, uh, that's a red line. So if they're furloughed, they're, they're not working. The first part of the question is how, how do you do it? So again, as I mentioned earlier on, this is a brand new concept. Um, so you know, HR legislation has been to a degree set to one side, but the legality here is that you are changing and deviating from the employment contract of the individual. So you should put them on notice. You should say that this is a variation to your contract. You're going to be furloughed from a certain date and, 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 and the employee, in theory, should, this should, should be done on a consensual basis. The reality is that the employee should know that if they, if they refuse to be furloughed, then the next movement by the employer will be redundancy. Because this is a measure to, to prevent wholesale redundancies in the UK. We have a little bit more detail in relation to, to how the scheme works. We don't have the detailed technical guidance, but we do know that the, the furlough period, interestingly, will be for a minimum of three weeks. So we don't fully understand why HMRC have chosen that, but essentially if you furlough an employee and take them back on day 20, as opposed to day 21, then the employer won't be entitled to the grant. So that's an important point to be aware of for employers. Um, <clears throat> the other point, which is um, you know, a significant impact for, for, for cash flow, a negative impact for cash flow, is as I mentioned before uh, in these forums, this is a reimbursement scheme. So you are paying the employees to be furloughed and then you are applying for that furlough grant from HMRC. You're applying into a portal that doesn't yet exist. So there is a, there's a level of trust here um, that the, the system will be operational and will work. The, uh, the, the, the caveat, I suppose, the, the, uh, the, the comfort blanket for employers is that in theory, if they don't have sufficient funds to pay the employees during the furlough period, they could apply to the bank for a civil's loan 
But again, because of the lead time of, of processing those CIBLES applications, I, for example, March year end, uh, sorry, March month end is coming on. Tuesday was 31st of March. Employees were paid. Whether they were furloughed or not, the employer had to make those payments. So again, it, it's really new stuff that the, uh, the systems aren't yet in place, but we, we do have a good feel for the, for the rules of engagement in relation to the, the, uh, the furloughed employees. So just in the, the interest of clarity here, um, we have two questions that you've kind of answered there already, and that is, will HMRC pay my employees directly if I furlough them is the first question. And the second one is, do I have to pay the 20% top up to my employees uh, if HMRC pay the 80%? So could you just clarify both of those points? Yeah, okay, so this, again, um, the first point was, and I touched on it earlier, as, as you mentioned, um, the, the employer gets reimbursed. So in any, in any circumstance, the employer has to pay these furloughed employees. So they will form part of the normal month-end payroll. You classify your employees into two categories, normal PAY employees and furloughed employees. And it's quite, it's quite um, clear that you might have a situation where someone gets furloughed mid-month, which is, you know, that, that would be normal insofar as anything is normal at the moment. So in that case, if someone is furloughed on the, on the 16th of April, for example, then they will sp spend half the month as a regular employee and half the month as a furloughed employee. So, um, it, and again, in any event, at the end of April, you pay them and then you apply to HMRC for reimbursement. Um, the second uh, part of that question was about the, um, the top-up. So the top-up was, the Chancellor was silent on the top-up uh, when the announcement was made on the 20th of March. And over the weekend, he was contacted by some very large employers who said that they couldn't afford to pay the 20% and they were going to make their workforce, redu workforce redundant even allowing for the furlough scheme. So the Treasury announced on the Monday, whatever they did that was, 23 March, that um, it's not mandatory for employers to, to top up the 20%. And that's helpful because in reality, if you have an employee, bearing in mind this grant is in relation to gross pay up to two and a half grand per month per employee. So if, the, if HMRC will pay 80% up to two and a half grand a month, then that means that if you have an employee on 37,500 pounds per annum and you furlough that employee, then, and you don't pay the 20% top up, which you're entitled to, to not do, then HMRC will pay 80% of that person's wages. Now, I know certain circumstances where we've done calculations for our clients and when you take into account the savings the employee is making on parking and travel and transport in general, and you know, eating out potentially whatever, in fact, a lot of employees are actually not very much out of pocket at all. We, we've worked out the average is 50 pounds a week per employee. So that shows you how generous this scheme is, that really you can set aside your workforce if they're earning just under 40 grand a year and the government will pay 80% of those salaries and these people will, you know, they'll be out of pocket, yes, but, you know, not too bad. Now, so if you take that one step forward, when the announcement was made, or prior to the announcement being made, the Treasury had run some numbers and they thought it would cost the government £10 billion to fund the furlough scheme for the life of, of the facility. It looks like every employer in the UK will be furrowing some of their staff some of them, all of the staff. This is going to cost the government north of 30 billion, possibly close to 50 billion. That's an eye-watering sum, absolutely huge amount of money. But really there's nothing the, the, the Treasury can do about this. It's a very, very generous scheme. And you, if you look at your business, how can you avail of this scheme? Well, if you have 10 employees and you've enough work for five, then you don't, put people on four day weeks or three day weeks, you don't reduce their pay by 20% or 25%, you furlough five of them. Because the government are gonna pay 80% of those wages for the furlough period. So okay, the, 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 the shoulders of the remaining five employees will have to be a little bit broader, potentially, depending on, on, on what workflow looks like. 
but really, you should be considering using this scheme. It's, it's unparalleled. Um, the most generous in the world and unparalleled. Uh, and you know, you'd expect it's a Labour government we have in power, the, uh, the, uh, the scale and scope and generosity of some of these announcements. But you know, the Treasury realised that the uh, UK PLC has had a heart attack and it needs to be on life support. And, and, and this really is pumping money around the veins of, of UK PLC. Okay, it's, it, the scheme is due to last until the end of May. I can see them really, un, unless, unless, okay, if the lockdown still exists at the end of May, the furlough would clearly have to continue. But if there's some form of normality returning and we're just limited to social distancing and people are allowed out of their houses, etc., and that scheme will be ended because it is, it is a remarkably generous scheme. Okay. Going back to the SCISS explanation, um, would payments uh, on the scheme be backdated to March uh, when it starts in June? Yeah, they will. Um, and, and the other thing I forgot to mention about that scheme, actually, is that bizarrely, self-employed individuals are allowed work during this period. So it's different to the furlough. If you're furloughed, you absolutely cannot work. But if you're self-employed and you're going to claim under the SEISS scheme, you can still work during this period. Okay. Uh, another interesting question. Uh, will my business PAYE stroke NIC payments be automatically deferred? They're not automatically deferred. Um, the only automatic deferment in terms of any form of crown taxes are your VAT. So, uh, again, I touched on this last week, but this is an important point to, to sort of reinforce to people. The VAT deferment is automatic, but if you pay your VAT by direct debit, HMRC systems will claim that VAT from your bank. So for example, VAT return ended 29th of February. That's due to be debited on the 10th of April, so next week. And that VAT will leave your bank account if you don't cancel the direct debit. So anybody who pays VAT by direct debit and you can't afford to pay the VAT, then you contact your bank and you cancel the direct debit. If your VAT is paid by BACS or by check or any other form of payment, then you don't have to do anything. It's an automatic deferral. You do, under every circumstance, have to file your VAT return. So HMRC know what VAT they should have received, but it won't, be, it won't uh, there's no penalties for VAT due between, in fact, the date is from the 20th of, of March until the 30th of June. Two other important points, actually, just while I'm on that topic, any VAT that is deferred is interest-free until the 31st of March 2021. So that's quite generous as well. You've got a quarter's VAT deferred for a year, essentially, and you have to pay it back sometime between now and the end of March 2021. Um, now, so I wandered into VAT there. It was actually a PAY question. So PAY and NIC, or CIS taxes, they're paid monthly normally around the 22nd of each month. There isn't an automatic deferment. But if you phone or the business phones the COVID-19 hotline in the time to pay section of HMRC, you get, you get a deferment. There is no problem. The revenue is spending 90 seconds on the phone, whereas if you made a similar request two months ago with a five-minute conversation and they asked you what you had for breakfast and the measurement of your inside leg, etc. Now what they're saying is, no problem. We understand the circumstances. Update us before the end of June and then we can decide what to do. Okay. I own a number of pubs, so do I have to pay? I wish I owned a number of pubs, but I own a number of pubs. Do I have to pay my business rates? So the answer is uh, yes, up until 31 March 2020, so <clears throat> on Tuesday. Um, and you would have anyway, because most people pay their rates probably by direct debit and their 10 installments that, that are paid up to January. So most business, most commercial rate pairs have already paid their rates um, by the time January came around this year. So uh, the answer to, to that, um, that question is that no, if, if you, for, from the 1st of April, so yesterday, until the 31st of March 2021, that business won't have to pay business rates because they're in that sector, the hospitality, leisure and retail sector. Okay. Um, I have a turnover of 50 million per annum, so how do I get a CCFF loan? Okay, there's, a, there's an acronym for you. Um, that stands for the COVID-19 Corporate Financing Facility. Uh, I've mentioned before, I'm not sure why 
the Treasury decided to call one facility the coronavirus scheme and the second one the COVID-19 scheme. But nonetheless, um, greater minds than mine made that decision. So unfortunately, there is a squeezed middle here. I referred to it earlier on in relation to the sort of contractor companies. There's a similar example here. If you turn over more than 45 million pounds a year, then you're, you're not eligible for the Sybils facility. The logic there is that you're a large business. Um, the assumption is that your business has an investment grade rating. Now, this is not true. Any business that has an investment grade rating generally turning over 250, 500 million a year. There's a huge amount of UK businesses turning over between 45 million and 200 million that haven't got an investment grade rating. Now that's not to be confused with, with your credit rating. So every business has a credit rating, but the Bank of England are running this facility, the CCFF facility, and what it is meant to do is allow a large company to create debt, to sell, a, a, um, corporate paper essentially sell a bond um, to the bank and the bank will then advance that money uh, it'll be paid through the ccff scheme and that's fine but a lot of uk business won't be able, won't be able to get that on day one so there was obviously a, a lot of to do about this when when the, the treasurer realized there's a big gap in the funding market so the bank have said, if you are in this bracket, then you need to speak to your bank first of all, and see, do they consider you to have an investment grade rating? That's a nonsense, nonsense question. Banks don't consider whether their clients have investment grade ratings. The reality is what has to happen is you need to speak to Moody's or one of the large Standard & Poor's, for example, one of the large credit rating agencies to get a rating and then take that rating to the Bank of England and they will give you money. That's not quick, it's not easy. So that, that's a problem for, for large companies. Now the only, the only thing that's um, helpful in this department is generally a company of that size, one would hope they're in fairly good shape anyway. So if, they, if their business has stopped and they need an extension to their overdraft for two or three months, then you, you would hope that under normal banking conditions, the credit committees would advance those funds anyway. Um, but but it, is, it is a potential problem for, for businesses that didn't have much, enough meat on the bone and they're in that turnover bracket, then they, they have a real challenge. Great, well listen, Martin, thank you very much in terms of um, uh, all the questions and thank you everybody for their contribution in asking those very, uh, very good questions today. Uh, we'd like you to continue to communicate with us in this regard um, and we'll be seeing you again in the um, near future, Martin, to give us more updates. Um, so thank you very much for today's contribution and we'll be talking to you soon again. You're welcome. Thanks, Paul. See Cheers. you guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.